Welcome everyone of you, it's your first time. You're in the right place. This is the right place to be. And we hold two kinds of, of, of forums. One we call the, the hub, and the other one we call what? The, the fireplace. The fireplace. And I, the fireplace, I'm I confused because the names are related. They, they are all around the fire. The hut, the hut is where you do the in-house thing. Yeah. Yeah. This is where we come as Christians and just learn from one thing. Matters that are just around Christian. But the fireplace is where we open and engage other people who have different views about our faith. We discuss around that and you are invited. So we do this the second week of every month. The first, the first. The second, the second Wednesday of every month. Sorry, these details miss. But the second Wednesday of every month, we call this event around here. Can you, can, can you explain to us what ornithology is to be there? And he's, he's the national director of Arocha Kenya. And he will, he will also tell us more what that entails. So, ladies and gentlemen, join with me as we welcome the speaker with a hand clap. Um, thank you, Santi. Uh, as you heard, my name is Colin Jackson. Um, I'm also known as Kibet out of Jackson. I was born in Nairobi. Um, my father was born in Nairobi, so I grew up in Nairobi, in fact. So it's been it's nice to be back in my home city, because uh, these days I stay at the coast in Watamba. I've been there for over 20 years now. Um, working for Arusha. Um, Ornithologist, what does that mean? Well, I'll show you. Let's see if this is going to work. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, um, Arosha Kenya is the organization I work for. Uh, Arosha is a Portuguese word. It means the rock. It's actually two words since the gap in the middle, the rock. Uh, it's often spelt in one word, but that's incorrect. So it's a Portuguese word because the, the project was, or the organization was started originally in Portugal. Uh, and the name has been kept as it's kind of a, a neutral language. Yeah? But we're now operating in about 20 countries around the world. And uh, I was blessed to be able to work in the original project after I left university as an ornithologist. Does anyone know what an ornithologist is? <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> Perfect, yeah. So ornithology, ology is always the study of something. So biology is the study of? Bio, the sort of natural things, yeah? yeah. Um, so or theology is the study of? Of God, theo, yeah, God. <laughs> so mammalogy would be the study of? Mammals, yeah. <laughs> Entomology, we have testing in here. Entomology, what is that? <laughs> study of insects. insects. So ornithology is the study of birds. And uh, I've been spoiled in that. I'm a bird watcher. I grew up, as I said, in Nairobi. We had over 10 species of just sunbird, which are the bright colored ones. 10 different species in our garden here, alone, in Kile. And uh, I just got an interest as a kid. And, my parents had an old pair of binoculars and a bird book and I just started inquiring and finding out more and that's where my interest started uh, as an ornithologist. I then went on and I studied environmental science at uh, university in the UK and while I was there I heard about Arosha and ended up going to work there when I finished it at university studying birds, bird migration, resident populations, um, but as a Christian working in conservation because Arosha is a Christian conservation organization. Um, hence the strapline conservation and hope. Uh, we believe that there is hope for the planet as Christians. And that's what we're, to talk, we're here to talk about tonight. Um, which is a great privilege for me. I love talking about this. Uh, those who know me, I'm Bill, we've had some, lots of discussions about this. And it's, it's close to my heart. Because I, I can see the beauty in the world around us. And I can also see the destruction that's going on. Um, and it's, it's something which I believe God is really concerned about. Uh, and yet, many Christians don't really understand uh, the, the importance of that. So, I think without further ado, I'll just carry on with this. Um, so, Ahosha, Christians in Conservation. So, 
my job as a Christian working in conservation for a Christian organization is partly to go bird watching. That's a lot of what my actual job, well I wish it involved it more, it used to involve it more when I was uh, <laughs> not in charge. Unfortunately as you go up in the ladder you get to stop doing the things that you're good at or enjoy and I'm doing the things I'm bad at. Because I'm managing people. <laughs> um, I feel much more comfortable in this position. But um, Arosh is about doing field work, so going out doing bird surveys or insect surveys or mammals or fish. Um, studying them, learning about their biology, learning about their ecology, as Christians, as an act of mission. Now a lot of people, when, and we had a, a, a strap line before called Christ, uh, Christians in Conservation, and many people, both Christians and those who are not yet Christians, would say, Ati, what? Christians? Conservation? You've got to be joking. Since when? Since when has the church ever been involved, been interested, been relevant to the environment. And particularly those people who are keen environmentalists, many of them said, guys, you Christians are actually the reason for environmental problems in the world today. And there's a very famous essay written in the 60s by a guy called Lynn White, um, who uh, basically placed the, the the root cause of environmental degradation, which was starting then in a big way, at the foot of the church, saying the church and Christians have taken the verse in Genesis, go and take dominion of the earth and rule over it as a license to go and do what we want. Yeah? And uh, it's been an upward struggle to try and get people to understand what I believe is the true biblical interpretation of uh, taking dominion over God's earth. And we'll be looking at that uh, now as we continue. First of all, let's just have a quick overview of some of the issues. Now these are probably, for many of you, these are very, very familiar because this is in the news the whole time. Uh, if you are reading the news or aware at all, you cannot miss these sorts of headlines that are going on. Wildlife populations have crashed the world over. Rhinos, uh, um, a lot of our wildlife here in Kenya, in Africa, is really on a major decline. Uh, in Kenya, we've lost 11 species of bird in the far past 50 years. No longer possible to see them in Kenya. Um, one of them, this one, white winged apalis. Um, vultures, once very, very numerous, uh, now 90 to 95% decline. They've gone from many, many places. In India, 99% decline in some areas. Um, huge, huge declines and crashes of populations of wildlife. 90% of the big fish in the oceans are gone. Um, sharks, this, which is, and the estimated the smallest decline of sharks is about 87% decline of sharks in the world. Um, many species in certain areas have gone by up to 99%. They've just gone. It's, 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 it's scary. And as a conservationist, as someone who loves has a passion for the wildlife, of course it's very painful uh, when you see that. And I've seen it probably even you in your own lifetime, particularly if you speak to your, your parents or to the Waze, they'll tell you, oh yeah, this place was a forest before. We were back shouts like, yeah? You would have so much wildlife and a lot of uh, forest and so on, which is no longer there. The extinction rates are now 1,000 to 10,000 times greater than in the recent past. So we've got a major problem going on. Habitat degradation. 45% of Africa is experiencing desertification of varying degrees. That's getting drier and drier. Um, Kenya loses 5.6 million trees annually. That's a lot of trees yeah, that we are losing annually. Okay, there's some being planted as well, and that's great. Um, but our true forest cover is actually down to 1.5% from what it was at 12. Now, you'll speak to some people, maybe in KFS and others, who say, no, 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 I'll, I'll our uh, forest cover is going up, it's 2.5, getting near to 3. But when you look at that, if you look at the detail of what has been talked about, that's just trees planted, and it doesn't necessarily form forest cover. True forest cover, for anyone who's done biology and environmental science, will know that it should be closed canopy forest, particularly we're talking indigenous forests here. Yeah? And those have declined dramatically and are still going down. 
they're not really recovering. There's no real evidence or cases of regeneration of forests that is being done on a significant scale. Only very, very small pockets of it. Ethiopia, our neighbor, has gone down from 40% to about 3%. Dramatic declines of that. If you look at the Maui Escarpment, which of course has been in the news uh, again, 1973, you can see the green, the dark green, and any of the green is basically vegetation, and forest bush, the dark green. Here you can see how it's just, it's all been cleaned up, and a lot of the forest is gone. This area here, you can see over that side, gone, gone, gone. And as a result, because the forest cover is going, we're getting flash flooding. And this is a huge problem across the country. And again, Narok was had serious floods this year, didn't it, I believe. And that is a direct result, direct result of the removal of forest cover upstream in the Maui Scar on the Maui. There's no, there's no question about it, yeah? That you remove forests, you remove vegetation cover, and the sponge effect that God created in that forest of absorbing rainfall and letting it get into the, into the ground and go out slowly, slowly, slowly through springs, it goes. And so what happens is that you have the rain hits the surface of the ground, there's no vegetation, it flows over the surface of the ground into the rivers, and you get flash flooding. Are we together? Now, it's a very simple equation, really, um, but one that we don't care about, and we continue to cut the trees and, and remove what is then going to cause us massive problems and huge expense to the country in terms of our economy. The billions of shillings, which are through destruction, of, of people's livelihoods and farms and all the rest of it is phenomenal. In town here, you get you know what used to be, and when I remember as a kid, there used to be a sign outside as you arrived at the airport. Uh, anyone from Guinea coming from the airport can see this big sign, Welcome to Nairobi, the green city in the sun. Yeah, Because Nairobi was a forest. You know, the reason Nairobi is where it is, as I'm sure you will know, is because when the railway was built, it was crossing the plains, and then they hit the forests, yeah? And this is where the forest started in the mountains and all the rest, and it was hard work putting the, the railway through. So they formed a big railway sort of dump site here, uh, kind of to build up all the goods and equipment and whatever, so it became a huge camp and then turned into a city eventually. So it's forest, we're right on the forest here. But those trees have gone. And what developments are doing are clearing all the trees, putting Sumiti from wall to wall. When it rains, there's nowhere for that rain to go except into the drain and into the river, and you get this because it's massive flash flooding. That water should be underground, being soaked up through trees and lawns and grass and parks and things, but it doesn't, it goes in over overground. And so there's no sponge effect. Kilimanjaro, for those who are old enough to remember a kitty in the sort of 20, 30 years ago, there it had an amazing snow cap. Now it's like this, a tiny little cap. In the, rain, the rains, you get a bit more snow on there, but actually there's very little snow there. Mount Kenya, the glacier going up to Point Lanana. When, uh, in 1985, I climbed Point Lanana. I was about 16 or something. And I remember from the top, the ice reached about 20 feet, or 20 meters from the, the peak of Point Lanana. Now, you have to, in fact, what I did is I sat on the ice to go down. I slid down the ice. On the final descent. Now you have to climb down, I don't know, it's about 500 meters or more before you start to reach. And I think yes, the ice has gone altogether. I've not been up there in recent years, um, but from what I hear, it's gone. That ice is all melted and gone. Um, pollution, of course, is another huge thing, and plastics have become a massive uh, thing around the whole world. And again, if you listen to the international news, I'm, you should have been hearing a lot of stuff about plastics and the problem that plastics are in, in the planet, in the ecosystem. Um, if you eat a, a plate, apparently, like if you go to Europe and eat a plate of, of seafood, like mussels or something, you could, you, on average you're consuming about 60 pieces of plastic from that one plate. Because it's in the oceans, it gets into the ecosystem, into the uh, organisms, the, the fish, the shellfish, etc. Uh, yeah, this is all familiar to us. In fact, they used to say that we have a national flower. Thankfully, that's decreasing since the law last year. Yeah, of no plastic bags. Because seriously, 
as you approach the village, uh, we we'll call sort of Masadan, you come from a distance, you see all these lovely white, black, green flowers in the bushes and the trees. Yeah? Kumba, you get there, they're white. <laughs> <Little bags. laughs> yeah? They're like our national flower, which is not something to be proud of. Huh? But thankfully, that has decreased, I think. It's certainly, I'm sure, the, the ban on plastics is you know, a good thing. Um, and we need to think of ways of doing that, which we can assist on that. So just a, a, a press release from IUCN a few years ago. Biodiversity underpins. So biodiversity means the wildlife, basically. Yeah? Um, the animals, birds, insects, and so on around us. Um, underpins the flow of ecosystem goods and services. You only fuel, food, fiber, etc. Anything that the ecosystems give to us, biodiversity underpins that. It's a key resource of tourism, and yet some two thirds of 66% uh, of ecosystems around the world are in decline. Biodiversity loss is a greater threat than climate change. Um, when we degrade the ecosystems, they reach a point of no return. And as for species, extinction is forever. And it's quite a Quite a uh, sort of scary statement, that really, if you think about it and take it seriously. So, for sure, there's a lot of doom and gloom. And as a conservationist, it can get pretty depressing, uh, in fact. And I've talked to conservationists before who really got very depressed about it because they have this passion for the environment around them, and yet, whatever they try and do, you know, the big corporates have more money than they can throw it out. There's corruption, and, you know, the guys with the money just do what they want. I mean, you're fighting, fighting, fighting. You win some battles, but you feel you're losing the war. Um, and so, as Christians, and for me as a Christian, what is my response to that? And does the Bible have anything to say about this? Or is the Bible silent? Is the Bible relevant in this? Was it only about saving souls and about, you know, being born again and how you treat your families, maybe finances. Jesus talked more about finances than anything else. Um, is, it, is it about that sort of thing? Is it about how we relate to each other? Is that what the Bible speaks of? Or, actually, is it relevant to even environmental issues? Which some people say, that is for the rich. It's a luxury. If you have time to go bird watching, it means you're rich and wealthy. You don't have to be struggling to survive. Yeah? And actually, the Bible, therefore, it's more about the core things which are important in society and not about the environment. Well, let's see what happens. Because I believe, actually, that the Bible speaks a lot about hope for the world, for the planet, and that the gospel is a whole gospel. It's not a partial gospel. It's not just only for a certain uh, segment of, of life. It's a whole gospel for a whole world. You know, it's for the everything that is encompassed on the planet. A lot of people say, well, hold on. Surely, though, okay, God created the world, that's cool, he made it beautiful, that's fine, yeah, okay, we need to, we need to make sure we don't throw plastic bags or whatever out and so on. But surely as Christians, surely the key thing is spiritual issues. And that's what we should be focusing on. And that material things, yeah, no, it's important that you should look after your body and whatever, and yeah, okay, there is a certain amount of care we need to take for the environment. But really, God's real concern is about our spiritual state and where we're at. That is what we call a, a dualism, a dualistic understanding of what I believe God uh, speaks to us about in, in the Bible. It's about saying, okay, there's the spiritual world and then there's the material world. And the material world is all going to burn anyway, and you know, it's there for us to get stuff out of the use, but actually spiritual things are the important things. And so, you know, for me to be a full-time Christian worker means I have to be a pastor, or at least sing in the choir, or, you know, or teach in a Christian school. So I'm, you know, it's involving teaching kids about Jesus and about God. That's what Christian ministry is about. But that mission, no, 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 no. The, the material side of the world actually is less important. And it's not really part of what God really is at the core of his heart. Well, I would beg to differ on that. And if we start right at the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis 1, we read that God created the heavens and the earth, and he saw that it was very good. Now, for a start, if God is saying something is good, 
not just good, but very good. And if you read through the accounts in Genesis, he speaks of it being good more than once. It's like four or five times. He says the creation he created is good. And if God is calling something good, and that's the material world, this is not sort of spiritual things, this is the material world. If he calls it good, then who the heck are we to start saying it's not important? If God says something is good, surely it is good. And therefore it's something worth taking note of and, and um, considering seriously. Even more, the whole of what God did, as we believe, and the, the Bible teaches us, that here in Philippians it summarizes nicely that Jesus, who, being in very nature God, this is God himself, yeah, this is not just some good prophet or something, this is God himself, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. In other words, God, spiritual God, God the Spirit, became God the material, the human, the physical. And if God himself would do that, go say, actually, no, from, the, from being spiritual, I am going to uh, manifest myself as in a material, physical form, that as well surely puts a huge emphasis on how important God believes the material is. That to him, the physical is also important. It's not something which we can just cast away on the side. Whose world is it then? We believe God created the world. Yeah, it's, the scriptures are clear of that. And I think you'll find very few people, particularly in Africa, it's great for us here, you know, as conservationists working in, as Christians, it's great that 90% of people we talk to in, in, in Africa, in Kenya, believe that A, God exists, and B, that he created the world. Now after that, there may be some differences, but you go to Europe or the West, it's hard work, because a lot of them don't even believe that God exists, <laughs> let alone that he created the world. So, but stand as starting on that basis, which the, the, the Bible does speak very clearly of. Um, whose world is it? Who does it belong to? Because again, many Christians say, actually God gave the world to me, and it's mine. He created it for me to benefit from. For us as people, we are the center of what it's all about. But actually, the Bible's very clear that the earth doesn't belong to us. It belongs to Him. The earth is the Lord's. Everything in it, not just part of it, everything, including our pockets, including ourselves, yeah? Everything in it belongs to God, the world and all who live in it. Also in Leviticus, it says, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you are but aliens and my tenants. So that, that, that can't be a, a more clear, that the world, the creation, the environment around us belongs to God. It is his possession. So your shamba, you think it's your shamba, but ultimately, actually it belongs to God. And we are but tenants of that. So we are using it but with the understanding that it belongs to him. And so possession is a very, very powerful concept in terms of the way something is treated. If you hire a car, you're probably less likely to look after it than if it was your own. Isn't that true? Yeah? You know, you think, ah, it doesn't matter if I drive rough over this road. The guys, they'll fix it. It's okay. You know, um, or doing handbrake turns, you know, as guys or whatever. <laughs> you know, because it's not your car. But if, if it was your car, then you'd probably treat it with more concern and care. Yeah? Possession is a very important thing. Um, and of course, that's throughout society in many ways. So if the world belongs to God, then that really does form a very strong foundation upon which we can build our understanding and our theology of creation care. So who did God make the world for and why? Did he make it for us? And that is, that is a belief that's held by many, many Christians, that actually the world, God created the world for our benefit, that we could enjoy it. The sunsets are beautiful because I can then enjoy it. That's why did God did it. The, the rain falls so the crops can grow so that I can benefit from it. And the, the cows get fat so that I can benefit from it. Yeah? It's all about that, isn't it? Yeah? And, and that is really a very strong, a very strong uh, sense that is out there in, in the world. Um, 
minerals put in the in the in the earth so that I can dig them out and we can benefit from it and get smartphones or whatever else you can from it. Yeah? And that is very much what we call an anthropocentric worldview. An anthropocentric, well, another big word here. Um, <laughs> Anthropo is God is man centric, of course, it's centered, so it's a man centered worldview that we are the center of the universe. So there's a circle, man is in the middle, and that's that's where it is. Mankind that means when I say man, I include ladies as well. <laughs> <laughs> mankind, um, so and the question, therefore, is is that what the Bible teaches? Is it that God created the world for us to benefit? Of course we do benefit, and he blesses us through creation. Of course, that's very much there. But was that the purpose? Well, if we read Colossians 1.16, that's an amazing passage, that first chapter of Colossians. It's an incredible passage about uh, the relationship of God and creation. Um, but in verse 16, it says, All things have been created by him and for him. And it's very clear that it was created for him. For God, not for us per se. In Job 38, um, it speaks of who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm to water a land where no one lives, an uninhabited desert, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass. And the, the, the feeling about the word grass is it's more than grass, it's the flowers, it's the amazing biodiversity, the, the display of flowers and and the beauty that is out in the desert when the rain falls. I don't know how many of you have been to a desert and seen the flowers that come out there. The west coast of South Africa, if you ever, ever get the chance to travel to South Africa, try and go to <coughs> August and try and go up the west coast of, of South Africa. It is mind-blowingly amazing to see carpets of flowers just going to the horizon. Amazing diversity of radiant colors of, of flowers. Now the Bible's telling us that in that desert, because the rest of the year is pretty dry, there's a desert. God created that beauty in a place where no man has ever set foot. And it's, it's not there for us to benefit from. It's not there for us to say, oh wow, it's amazing, God is great, you know, this is so cool, I can have an amazing time. No, because it wasn't designed for us. No, the Bible teaches actually that creation gives glory to God. That's what it's about. That the world is created by God for Him to give glory to Him. The creation declares the heaven, the, the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at His command they were created. Let them praise. And so creation is there to sing a praise, a praise song to God. And, and in fact, it's, uh, it's sometimes been likened to like an orchestra or a band playing an amazing piece of music. Yeah? That all the different components, the different parts of the of the biodiversity and ecosystems, and that when it comes to extinctions, it's like taking one of those voices out, or like the bass guitar. If you take the bass guitar out of a band, does it sound so good? No, it doesn't, does it? So it's like if you make a species extinct, it's like that 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 uh, song of music of praise of worship to God is diminished by the removal 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 of that species. So, as I uh, explained at the beginning, I'm an ornithologist, so I can't not show you some photos of birds <laughs> and talk about birds, because uh, we're talking about the glory of God um, in creation. As I study the, the raw material of God's worlds, it just blows my mind. This is a little thing called the willow warbler, weighs about 9 grams, so one of those small packets of majani, about 50 grams worth of majani, you can fit 5 of those. Yeah. Okay. They're not. They're not big. They're tiny little birds. And yet, this is a bird. Where we get birds here, individuals of this, of this species that breed in northeastern Siberia, in Russia, and they migrate all the way down to Kenya, and further south into Tanzania and Mozambique, a distance of over ten thousand kilometers, one way. Um, and they will go back to the very same tree that they bred in last year. They can find their way back uh, to the, the very sa same same tree where they bred before. Um, so this is an amazing little bird, and we catch them. We see them here. They're very common in the right time of the year. You can see lots of them. Um, you've probably seen them without realizing. 
these lines. Um, and it's an amazing part of God's creation that a tiny little thing like that can migrate so far and so accurately and find its, its way back to the same nest where it, it bred. We know that because we put rings on the legs with a little number, a number like double show, and we address the museum. So if someone finds it somewhere else, they can report to the museum. Bamba and Degas and Bangini number for they found it wherever they were, and then you can match it up. So we've had we've had a species of bird that we, we caught in Watam, and it was reported from Finland. I had flown all the way to Finland and was breeding in Finland. So it happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's amazing, huh? That's very cool. <laughs> Ringed one in uh, in in Russia, next to its nests, and it travelled to Africa. Would have been found here, and he caught it again the next year back at the same nest in the same tree. And I've done that here at the museum. We've caught uh, migrant birds like this in subsequent years that have been to Europe and come back. We catch them in the same same net a whole year later, uh, two three years in a row. It's amazing. It's quite a bit. They use the stars to navigate, they use the moon, they use the sun, they use the magnetic field of the earth, uh, and they can find their way there. And I don't know, did any of you watch the uh, eclipse of the moon recently? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So we were in Watama, it was really poor, because we were on the beach with no, no lights around. So we had this amazing view of this, the moon eclipse. Um, but as we were there, we were watching the stars, and we had a telescope, and because I'm a bird, I have telescopes so looking at birds. So we had the telescope on the star, and as people were looking at the stars and the, the planets, of course they were moving. So you had to keep adjusting the telescope to keep it on. Now you imagine if you were navigating, following a star, yeah, as a, a bird would be doing. If you just followed the star, what what sort of track would you end up following? So you'd be going in a in a circle like this. It's a deal. Yeah? So these things, you guys, you remember doing trigonometry at school? Who <laughs> 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 enjoys trigonometry? <laughs> yeah? These guys do a constant flow of trigonometry as they're flying. Because if they just followed the star, they'd be ending up going way off course. Yeah? They have to calculate, okay, the star's moving at this speed, it's going that direction, I want to go this direction, therefore I have to adjust my angle of flight by so many degrees every few minutes, like this, in order to fly straight. Jamaini, that is really amazing. What do you think? Yeah? I mean, seriously, to God be the glory. It's a little thing. From a little thing like this can beat you in your We have in Watan, they breed on the island where we are. It's called a sooty tern. Um, it's a bigger bird, wingspan about this big. Um, it's a beautiful bird, black above, white underneath, and it's a seabird. So uh, it's it's designed. The bill is designed for picking fish from the water, um, and the long wings are designed for flight. And this is considered to be the most aerial bird on the planet. Why? Well, because it's a seabird, it spends its whole life way out on the oceans. Now, that's not unusual. There's many species that do that. Yeah? But the difference with this guy is he hasn't got waterproofing in his plumage. So the plumage has got no oil. So you know ducks. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know that phrase in English, it's like water off a duck's back if you're not getting affected by something. Because you pour water on the duck's back and it flows off because there's oil in the, in the plumage. These guys don't have that oil. So if you poured water on them, it absorbs it like a sponge, and then they get waterlogged and they drown. So if they sat on the surface of the water to rest, they would just drown. They can't sit to rest. They can plunge dive to pick the fish out of the surface, but they can't sit. Okay? So, so what? Well, these guys only come to land to lay eggs and to breed. It's the only thing they have to come to land for, that's to lay an egg. So they only are sitting on the ground during the breeding season. So any time they rest on the ground. Between breeding seasons each year, they're flying non-stop. Because there's no, to, there's no trees and rocks or anything out in the ocean for them to, to sit on. Because they're hundreds of kilometers out in the ocean. So for one whole year, they're flying 
non-stop. Yeah, and I imagine you walking non-stop for a year. Yeah, that's what these guys do. But that's not the end of the story. Yeah, because actually there's quite a few species that do that. Um, these ones, the young don't nest until they're about six or seven years old. So from the, it is thought from the day that they they hatch from the island, the island they, they fledge, they leave the island with the parents until the first time they breed, six years later, they are flying non-stop. For six whole years. So it's amazing, huh? Isn't that just flying <laughs> And I mean, they're designed to fly. They're totally designed to fly. The wings are long and thin. The short legs. It's just an amazing feat that these have now lived for probably 15, 20 years, these ones. There's another one, a swift, that breeds in Beijing and spends the, the non-breeding season in the southwest corner of, of Africa, in, Nam in Namibia. They pass through here, and again, they don't stop flying from when they leave Beijing, go to South Africa, and all the way back to Beijing. Uh, they don't stop flying until they get back to their nest. It's amazing. It's incredible what these guys do. Another one. Can't stop telling you good stories. <laughs> this one, this is called a bar-tailed godwit. I don't know what the origin of godwit is, um, but uh, these ones, you look at that bird and you think, okay, it's walking in the mud, so it's got long legs for walking in water and the mud, and it's got a long bill. Those are the things that stand out for you, isn't it? Those two features: long legs and long bill. Uh, and, and, and indeed, the long bill is probing in the mud to get worms and whatever some food from the mud. So this is a bird which you think is perfectly designed and its main function is for walking in the mud and surviving in, in that way. Kume, this bird also flies ridiculous flights of migration. This, there's a population that breed in Alaska and they spend a non-breeding season in New Zealand. And it has been found that they will fly non-stop from Alaska to New Zealand. Non-stop. It's a distance of uh, about 11,000 kilometers uh, in nine days. So they're flying non-stop, 11,000 kilometers in nine days. And it's incredible that they can do that. It's an amazingly high rate of metabolism that they have in order to, to achieve that. Um, and the scientists, the ornithologists, when they discovered this were mind blown because we thought, you know, we knew they went on the return journey, they go via the Yellow, the yellow Sea in you know, Korea, and we thought maybe they go, yeah, maybe two or three thousand kilometers and then stop and feed and then they continue. Come on the return journey, they go non-stop across the Pacific Ocean to Alaska. It's just amazing. Really, really amazing. This is God's creation. Okay, I've told you about birds, because I'm a bird, yeah? Um, but actually, just look at the trees around here. If you talk to someone who knows about these trees, about the flowers, about the insects, even a mosquito, you'd be amazed about the facts that there are about that simple, simple, incredibly complex organism that might be so tiny. Think of the stars, the incredible vastness of the universe. When the Psalms say that heavens declare the glory of God, they're not joking. They're really not joking. You know, that psalm is really meant for everything about that, and it is so true. The heavens, the, bios, the, the, the biodiversity declare the glory of God. And that is what it's about. That's, and that's, for me, where it starts as a conservationist. As someone who is, appreciates the world around us, but actually the diversity, and the colors, and the, the brilliance of God's world is something to be appreciated and to say, wow, to God be the glory in that. So we see this amazing world around us, and these incredible facts, but we know that something has gone wrong. What has gone wrong? And where do we fit in? What is the problem? And what does the Bible have to say? Well, <clears throat> I'm not a theologian, but there is a, some, real, um, there's some really good stuff here in the Bible about um, God and about the environment, and us and our relationship with it. Actually, Relationship is a key word because God is a God of relationships. At heart, He is a God of relationships. He is within the Trinity, there's relationship. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's relationship there. And God has created the world in relationship. And He's put us 
as mankind in relationship with him. And much of the church has focused on that in our Christian teaching. Um, but actually, also, the rest of creation, God has put us in relationship with that as well. And the other thing is that we often overlook, as Christians from the Bible, is that actually we're being put into relationship with the rest of creation. In fact, we are mammals, aren't we? Human beings are mammals. And in that very fact, we are in a relation with the ecosystem. And as we breathe air, oxygen in, we breathe out carbon dioxide, don't we? And the trees out here rely on the carbon dioxide which we are producing, and they produce oxygen, which we rely on. So we are in relationship even with the trees. Yeah? And we're in relationship with the world as we drink a glass of water. We are in relationship with the ecosystem, with the world around us. We cannot deny that. Now in, the, in cities, we get a bit protected from that. We buy our meat in plastic bags, especially overseas. There's places where it's very canned in terms of our experience of the environment. But the fact remains that we are in relationship with that. And the Bible teaches us that there's a very strong triangular relationship between God, mankind, and the land. <coughs> and that actually he has created that, and that we, he has asked us to be not uh, to be overseeing that creation and to be stewards of that creation. Well, what has happened? What has gone wrong? And does the Bible teach us anything about that? Well, there's a passage in Hosea that's quite well known. And uh, this is uh, uh, Hosea the prophet speaking to the people of Israel. Um, and he says, Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. And of course, a charge is something you get charged for a crime, don't you? Yeah? So here he says, a charge, you're being charged for a crime. There's a charge to, against you uh, live in the land. There's no faithfulness, there's no love, there's no acknowledgement of God in the land. Instead, there's only cursing, lying, murder, stealing, adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Now, that could be picking up the standard and reading that, isn't it? You get this. Yeah, or well, looking at the news anywhere around the world today. Uh, this is what we read on a daily basis, isn't it? Stealing and bloodshed and, you know, adultery. It's all there. Yeah, this is basically that three-letter word we call sin. This is what he's talking about. So he's describing, he says, people of Israel, well, I have a charge to bring against you. There is sin in the land. Serious sin. And then he goes on to explain the consequence of that. And you'll see often in the prophets and in the Bible, that in the Hebrew thought, there's a lot of cause and effect talked about. Much more than I think we, really, we, we consider ourselves today. That to do some actions and attitudes and behavior will have an effect on a wider scale elsewhere. And sure enough here, because of this, because of this sin, the land dries up and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish in the sea are swept away. But they are dying. And so there's a direct link between sin and environmental degradation. And so, uh, also in Jeremiah you read it. How long will the land lie parched and the grass in every field be withered? Because those who live in it are wicked, are wicked, the animals and birds have perished. And again, it's a direct link between sin and the environment, wildlife suffering. And so what we see is that actually what happens is that sin breaks that relationship with, between God and humankind. And it breaks that triangle. And if you have a triangle and you snap one side, it's just going to fall apart, isn't it? Yeah? And that's exactly what's happened. So as we break our relationship with God, as we turn away from God, then the rest of the creation, the environment suffers because of that whole relationship God has put us into is broken down. And instead, we become e egocentric. We want things our way. There's greed. It takes over. And we exploit the world around us. And it's damaged in that way. In fact, the ecological crisis is a root. It's a spiritual crisis. It's not a physical. It's not a... And the, the answer to it is not getting better technology, or 
or more science or better research or you know getting people to you know to not use plastic bags and so on. They're all good things and they do help. But ultimately, ultimately at heart, the problem with the world today is a spiritual one. It's about us and God not getting our act together with God, which results in uh, an, uh, an ecological disaster. And that is very much the case. Because really, in a way, the ultimate problem with the world is greed. The reason there is environmental problems is greed. The reason you, you know, people will destroy things because they want things for themselves. You can't say poverty is driving it. But there's reasons for poverty that ultimately are greed, aren't they? Really. It's, and uh, that are driving that. We treat the world as, as a result of what we believe about it. If we believe it's important, if we believe that it's God's creation, it belongs to Him, and He made it for His glory, that will totally change the way you, you treat it than if you believe that it's there for you and for you to get what you want out of it. If you believe that, then there's a high chance you'll just exploit and end up destroying it. It's the same thing like the higher car. You know, if it's not your car, you're not gonna, it's not important to you. So you're going to end up not treating it in the same way. And then driving the crisis is the dominant religion of today, consumerism. Yeah? Actually, that's what it's all about. Consume, consume, consume. See how much you can get. And the advertising and everything around is all about, you need to have a better house and better clothes and a bigger car. And you know, even if you can't afford it, you need it. And you should get it. Otherwise, you're a loser. You really don't count. Yeah? <laughs> If you're not drinking the right beer or whatever it is, then you just you just don't count. You know, even Sprite. You know, you've got to have the. If you're not drinking the Sprite, you know, it's all there, isn't it? Yeah, we're being told about this the whole time, and so much of it is lies. Yeah, and it's not actually what is going to be good for us, nor good for the ecosystem and the whole planet. So the answer, well, the answer is in again in Bible. This is passage in Colossians again. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. This is Jesus, of course. And through him, to do what? To reconcile to himself all things. And that's not just people. It actually spells it out. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And that famous verse we all know, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So you know that one? Yeah, it's one of the best known verses uh, in the church. That word world in the Greek is actually cosmos. But we all read that as people. For God so loved people that he gave his only son. Isn't it? That is the normal interpretation of it. But actually he's saying for God so loved the world. He so loved the mosquitoes. He so loved mite. He so loved oranges. He so loved water. He so loved, you know, birds of paradise and lions and and goats, and you know, all of these things. God so loved it all so much that he did what? He gave his only son to live on this earth and die and rise again so that he could reconcile to himself all things through dying on the cross and rising again. Do you know many that is an incredible, incredible fact? It totally turns the whole environmental debate on its head and gives us the answer for what. Uh, is, the, is the world's problem, Jesus Christ. He is the answer to the problems of the environmental uh, degradation of our spirits. He is the answer to social problems. He is the answer to economic problems. He is the answer to all problems if we commit our lives to him and we do as he asks us. Because he designed us. He designed us in a special way to be very specially made. Each one of you was made very specially for a purpose. And as we explore God's purpose for us, then we can uh, experience the fullness of what He has promised for us. And it's outrageous. It's amazing. It's really, really incredible. In Christ is the answer. And so we see that triangle being healed through the cross, through what Jesus did on the cross. Um, and we're bringing back that, that triangle of, of which was broken through sin, and only through the cross of Christ can we have access to God. And can we receive that forgiveness and receive that healing, which can then bring healing to creation? And some of you will know that um, yeah, we, the church, have the answer. It's Christ. And some of you will know this passage, just to almost finished. Um, 
in Romans 8, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. And this is, my understanding of this is really that, yes, as we get our relationship right with God, as we allow that relationship to heal, then the healing comes to the land around us. And as we understand and as we, as we see the beauty of God in his creation, as we realize the value of the creation, because it belongs to God, our Father, he's our dad. Why should I destroy what is my dad's amazing creation? And he's given me the responsibility to look after it, to take care of it. Then as I realize that, then I start to take care of the world. And of course, then the creation rejoices. Because now the children of God are understanding how it is that we can look after it. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have goat roasts, nyama joma, you know, you shouldn't not kill animals, etc. It's not mean that we don't kill cut trees down at all. It's not, you know, there's balance in the way God has created us. No, but it's doing it wisely. That he's given us his world to use, yes, to use it, but use it wisely and not to destroy it. And that is the solution. That's why we do science. That's why I'm a researcher. I'm trying to understand God's world so that we can make wise decisions in how we use it. Set aside places for development and not develop others. When we do development, do it in a way which is sensitive to God's creation. When I'm planting trees in my garden at home, plant indigenous trees, the ones that God designed for that. But maybe have some alien, fast-growing ones from Kuni, so I don't have to destroy the <laughs> You see, this is all science. It's all coming out, it comes out in practical outworking. And this is my last slide, um, which is, uh, this is the response. And I was talking to Bill last night about it, saying, you know, actually as a conservationist, the theology and the discussions, and I hope we're going to have, I hope we've taken all the time for discussion, but um, theology is a great thing to discuss. It's wonderful to discuss, well, who is God and how does we relate to him, what does the Bible have to say about it, etc. But ultimately, if it doesn't end up with a response and an in action for us to change the way we're living and to become more like the way God wants us to be, then really, ultimately, what is the point? And I, I sort of say, you know, as Christians, if, well, as non-Christians, the world will tell you, ah, oh, the world is falling apart, all that, those facts I told you, we're in a disaster, the world is going down the toilet, it really is in problems, yeah? Therefore, we must do something to protect it. But as Christians, as a Christian, I can say, actually, I start from the position and say, wow, God is amazing, look at this creation, look how absolutely gobsmacking it is. Give God the glory. This is awesome. And then think, oh, shucks, we really have been messing it up. Lord, I'm sorry. Yeah, so we start with rejoicing. Rejoicing with God in his creation, what he has done. And then repenting. Saying, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. Sorry for us as a human race for the way we've messed up your world. What can I do in my own small way, even if it just means switching a light off to save energy? Even if it just means not throwing a sweet wrapper out of the window of the car. And how many of us have followed vehicles and seen Sajui, Delamere, whatever, these yoga pots coming out? I always just think there's a PhD to be done studying how fast people drink yogurt for another night of Asher. And then I wash it at Delamere as well. Afterwards, along the road, if you see it along the road, you can see Manzo Manzo, there's no takatakis. <laughs> and after about 10 cases, more. Okay. So the guys are drinking at what speed? And then 50 cases, you see one. Okay, I was really enjoying this. But it's true, isn't it? We've seen that. Things come out of windows, whatever. I was behind a police car the other day. I almost stopped and said, Mr. Officer, please. You know? But then from that, of course, is all this stuff. And this is, this is all good things. And there's so much information there on the internet and around us by non-Christians as well as Christians about how to reduce, reuse, recycle, restore the world around us and use the environment wisely. Yeah? And how we can take action 
and do it. And you know, in the days before plastic bags were banned, the uh, paper bags, I'd go to a kiosk and buy a soda, and they'd try and put it in a plastic bag for me. I'd say, no, 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 even milk. No, 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 I don't need a plastic bag, you know? I may have my own with me and say, why? Why do you want a, a paper bag? I said, because I'm a Christian. Because I care about God's world. It's important to Him that actually we need to not use plastic bags because they are destroying God's creation. And it's an immediately an, an option to, to talk to God, uh, talk to people about God and share with Him. So, um, yeah, there's plenty there. I could have talked till the cows come home on all of those things, but I'll stop there and uh, we can go on. <laughs> said that, we have had some of our board members who have been able to speak into uh, policy, so we've we had quite a word into the environmental education, sort of development of environmental education in the, in the national curriculum um, a few years ago. Um, but in terms of the impact of, of development and irresponsible development that has and is going on as we speak, um, we have not been able to have a very loud voice, but we have joined in on that. Now, we are hoping and planning as we grow that we will be able to speak more into, into that because it's very important. At the local level, yes, we do have. We've had a, a, a voice and a place to be able to speak into local decision making, uh, particularly around the coast where we are in Watamu, in the Malindi area. Um, and in fact, even next week, we're having a meeting with decision makers uh, in the county of Kilifi for. Uh, protection of our Rukuskoki forest, which is one of the most important forests in Africa for its biodiversity. Um, elsewhere, Arosha is speaking at a higher level. They've had a greater chance. In Ghana, there's a, a huge campaign that Arosha is leading to save a forest called the Tiwa Forest, which the government, together with the Chinese, are wanting to basically totally obliterate. They want to do open cast mining for bauxite to get, and I guess, aluminum ore out of it. Uh, and that just means totally taking off its huge open pits of, of mines. And it would destroy a unique forest and a massive water source for several million people living around there. So Arosha has been leading at very top level in that way. Um, and in other countries where Arosha is working, there has also been a, a chance to, to speak at the policy level. And it's important, not as Arosha, but we as Christians, that as we as Christians get to understand our responsibility in this arena, that yes, if you have, and there are individuals who are already at that position in policy, and you can speak into it, that as Christians, we need to take a stand of saying, actually, this is wrong, what is being done. It's being, this is a wrong against God. Not just, you know, the, the, a lot of the reasons for conservation that are given around the world are that, you know, you cut the forest down, then you lose rainfall, you know, because rain, trees bring rain. 
Uh, if you cut the forest down, then you might, then maybe the cure for cancer in that, in that forest. We don't know, maybe it's there, because some cures and things have been discovered in forests that weren't known there before. Um, it's our heritage. We need to save it for our children, you know, that they did. It's, it's pretty. We should keep it because it's beautiful, you know, for all these sorts of reasons. Ultimately, if someone's hungry, if they need to pay school fees, then really, you know, am I going to eat today or am I going to cut this tree down? Or oh, not cut the tree down and, and so it saves, it, stay hungry and not whatever. You see the, the difference. But if that person believes at heart, he's a Christian, he believes that this is God's planet and this forest, this tree belongs to God first and foremost, and that actually is important, he will think twice, if not three times, about cutting it down. The benefit, we still eat today, but not cut it down. And that's where we as a Roche come in, because we say, okay, actually guys, um, you know, this is God's creation, we try to teach people about that, and then we come in because we've got the research and the capacity to, and the ideas, the education, we can come say, right, how about putting a beehive in that tree? And we'll help you find a market to sell that honey so that you can make money out of it. Or there's birds that are using that forest and those birds are unique and there's tourists that like to see them so let's train you as a guide and give you a job and bring you good tourism. So there's all these different things but based on an understanding and a foundation that it's God's possession, it's God's world and that we cannot treat it in the way we want without first considering Him. And when you've got that as a foundation then you've got hope that there can be some change. And I suppose our, our vision and our hope is that we get decision makers in the higher policy levels who also believe that it's God's world and that they are answerable to God. Um, we do know that many of our politicians go to church and sing songs and you know even we feel so we get filmed tears flowing down their face and saying how you know how sort of pious they are and then we know that around the back they are corrupt as you can get. <laughs> Absolute snakes, you know? <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> Let's call them. <laughs> you know? yeah. And that is so two-faced. You know, God is not, they're not, this is, you know, if God really was their saviour, then there's no way they'd be doing to the environment they are doing. And they would go the extra mile of sacrificing extra cost to make sure that the railway goes around the National Park and not through, for example. Uh, it's interesting you brought up and your, your general theme was around the concept of hope. Could you please comment on uh, what the ultimate Christian hope is and how our view of heaven affects our practice, particularly with regard to environment? Because the popular theology is that God is only interested in saving our souls, so yeah. disembodied souls yeah. are the ones that eventually, you know, would outlive everything else. And so, what really is the value of this material world if all it does is just provide the housing for what really matters, which is our soul? Yeah. So, how, how does our theology of heaven yeah. affect how we live here on earth? No, it's a very, very good question, actually. And like I said, I'm not a the theologian, so I may have to have some help in here. But um, for sure, it's critical, our understanding of heaven and what happens. You know, the Bible speaks of the, the earth burning up, sort of thing. And that's one of the, the passages that a lot of Christians have said, well, it doesn't matter. It should all burn, so it doesn't matter what we do to the world. We use it the way we want. But actually, I think that's a misinterpretation of what is the Bible actually teaches. And it's really important for us to understand that heaven is not some ethereal, sort of funny, funny thing in the clouds. We're all going to be having wings on our backs and playing harps and sitting on clouds and, you know, all sort of uh, nice and dandy sort of things. That's not what heaven is going to be like. Actually, I believe what the Bible teaches is really that God is, is renewing the world. There's going to be a renewal and of uh, renewal of creation and that the world itself is not going to just vanish and disappear but he will heaven is going to be here on earth in fact the kingdom of god is already being advanced and jesus set that in motion you know and declaring that the heaven of the kingdom of god is here with us 
now. And we are seeking and working to bring the, the kingdom of God into action with us now. And that totally changes the way in which we would treat the world around us. That actually it's not just something that, you know, it's here now and gone tomorrow and finished. But actually God has created it with value for eternity. And that actually we are in a world which he's going to renew. We'll have renewed bodies. We'll have a renewed creation. Which we're not entirely sure how that will work. Um, but it's unbelievably <coughs> exciting to start to think of it. And I remember I, I, uh, I did, a, uh, did some, some Bible college uh, studies once. And I remember we had a, a talk by a guy, Chris Wright, who some of you may know of. Brilliant, brilliant speaker and writer. He's written this book called The Mission of God, which if you can get your hands on it, do and read it. It's about this thick, so it'll certainly get you to sleep here really well if you read it. So. But it's, it's brilliant, brilliant writing. And I remember him speaking. He gave us in one of his classes. He was talking of heaven and of earth. And you know, he says, you know, we don't really know what heaven's like. And you kind of think, well, actually, life here on earth is really quite nice. You know, do I really want to go to heaven? What, what's, you know, because we're comfortable in what we know. And he says, you know, it, in a way, it's a bit like, actually, if you think of uh, a baby in its mother's womb, and you can hear the noises going on out there, and you know, and it can, and maybe there's twins, and they're having this discussion together, you know. Uh, womb mates, you call it. You know, right? They're called womb mates. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can imagine a discussion saying, hey, wow, it's, do you think, what's going It sounds like amazing out there. Oh, no, it's nice and warm in here. I want to stay here. This is pleasant. We get food, we get water, we get sleep. It's comfortable, we're safe. You know, life is great in here. It's scary out there. I don't know what's going to happen. It can't be that good. And yet, for those of us who've been born and have seen the world and the amazing thing, it's so critical out here, how much better than just being cooped up in your mother's womb the whole time. And in a way, it's a similar sort of a complete paradigm shift from being in the womb to being in the world and all that is. That's what it's going to be like maybe going to heaven. We cannot really get a grip of it. It's going to be so incredible. But what we do know, my understanding is that it's God is renewing his creation. And so for Birders like myself, birding is going to be absolutely amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but that is going to be heavenly. <laughs> um, and it does, it does really affect the way we, we, we operate, I do believe. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you for, for the talk. I think uh, I was taken a bit aback when you spoke to of our snakes, you know, they are God's creatures. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you can't speak ill of them. Anyway. <laughs> Snakes are amazing creatures. Yeah, they really are. Yeah, anyway, my comment is this: I think uh, non-Christians are sadly to say at the forefront as we learn when we talk about environmental issues. We find non-Christians. Um, when you look at the leading Christian voices globally, uh, especially in the evangelical arm. We tend to have that view of the world was created for me mm. as predominant. Mm. This is the first time I'm hearing of a Christian organization that is engaged in the mm. care. How widespread is it other than the organization? How widespread is it? And especially in places like the US where almost everything you hear about no. the church doesn't look no. environment. Thank you. You're right. It is it's very, very true that actually there's still a very strong predominance within large sectors of the church that actually God created the world for us, and it's very much that anthropocentric uh, worldview that is there. Um, when Arosha started in 1983, I think it was got going, uh, the basic knee-jerk response from most Christians that uh, the founder, Peter Harris, and his wife, Miranda, met with when they went to churches and Christians was, dudes, that is not for the church. That is for Greenpeace. That's for tree huggers. That is new age. That is not for the church. Environmental things? No. Those are nothing. That is not. What the church is about is mission. It's And the mission of, of God is saving souls. And maybe hospitals where, you know, because people need a, a body for the soul to live in. So you've got to help them, you know. <laughs> 
And that's pretty much the attitude that there was, and it's been like that for centuries, you know? Um, so that was in the 80s, and that has been a constant battle that has been going. But actually, over the last 20 years, there's been a dramatic change in uh, much of the church around the world, possibly with the exception, probably not possibly, almost definitely with the exception of America, where still a Russia. Uh, we have got an Russia in America, an Russia project, but you'd think America's big and, you know, huge and there's lots of money and wealth and they do everything in a big style and big way. Actually, Russia USA is one of our smallest organizations. There's like one and a half employees. Um, for a nation. <laughs> a nation, 200 million or whatever, you know, the wealthiest nation in the planet. Um, and that's often because of that resistance which is met in the church. And, uh, you know, our dear Mr. Trump, is really one of the worst ones for that. Um, and using the church as an excuse to exploit and to get rid of the environmental controls and bills that are, no, no, we must make America great. And that means exploiting the environment, not protecting it. You know? um, and that is, that is, it's shocking. It's really embarrassing. I do know a number of American Christians who are deeply embarrassed by what is going on in that state. Um, but there is change. And you only need to look at the current Pope. Um, his Laudata Si that he produced, was it two years ago he wrote and, and published, is all about taking care of the environment and of creation. Um, in, there's the Lausanne movement, of which there's a major segment in that, which is about creation care. Um, and it's really picked up and there's a lot more understanding from many, many churches around the world that actually, if we are serious about God, God is serious about his environment and therefore we also need to be serious about taking care of it. And creation care is not something which is tagged on the end of what we do. If, we, if you're a birder like me, then it's cool, you can be interested in take care of the environment. We'll leave the tree huggers to hug the trees and you know, that's fine. And sadly, even in churches where they have recognized that creation care is important, often what happens is that they have a green group in the church, yeah? And there's a few guys who get together and they want to plant trees and they want to clean up, so do clean ups, they, you know, they're doing, they're getting the energy right in the church, you're putting solar and whatever. And so other members of the church, when challenged about their environmental footprint, say, so that's cool, as a church, we're doing all this kind of thing. They tick the box, but it's the green group that are doing it. I can carry on driving my big 4x4, four four, I can fly where I want, I can throw the rubbish how I want, I can run my business how I want. It doesn't matter, because the church, we're doing it, it's fine. You know, we're okay. Wrong. You know, it's like saying, uh, you know, teaching that it's, it's wrong to beat your wife. Yeah. And in a church, you have a group of the we look after our wives group. <laughs> you know? And the other guys go, beat him. That's okay, it's alright. We're looking after our wives, our wives at church, you know, there's the group, they're doing it fine. You know? But you know, as, as a church, we look after our wives. You know? Do you see the stupidity of it? Yeah? But that's what we do. And we do that so much, we say, that's fine, I tick that box, because I'm part of the overall church that's doing this. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to be so careful. This is a message, my friends. This is a message for each individual person. Say, so how do I, as an individual, respond in this? How do I use my resources? How do I buy things? Do I always buy the cheapest rice, because it comes from Pakistan? Or do I actually pay the extra and buy local rice? Because rice brought from Pakistan has burned a heck of a lot of uh, fossil fuels to bring it here. Yeah? And you see where it's come anyway, so I might as well buy it. Yeah? No, is that right? Is that the ethical response? Actually, we need to get serious about the way we treat it. And if all of us stopped buying that rice, it wouldn't be brought. Imagine if the whole church in Kenya decided we're not going to buy rice brought from overseas. Would they bring it? No, because the church is so huge that would be the complete market would go. And so that whole fossil fuel burning for there would disappear, would not be there anymore. Do you see what's happening? 
We have a responsibility as individuals and to share that with each other. Planting indigenous trees in our garden. Yeah? Oh, there's so much we could talk about in that way. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. My name is Steve. I actually don't attend this church. I attend in Blanca. And the first time I had uh, you were in the summer, so to speak, it was in Blanca. So um, I have a lot to say, but uh, you bear with me. I am an architect, and we do a lot of urban planning and all that in school. And one of the things that really, really challenges me is when Christians ask, Sorry to say, is, is when Christians ask, ask uh, the green group in church, have you engaged them policy makers? But what you have said last actually ties everything together because we are all the policy makers. The verse I wanted to read is uh, Genesis 1.26, which says, Then God said, Let us ma make man mankind in our image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock, and the wild animals, and over all the creatures that live along the ground. So my friends and I decided to start a group, a green group in church. And uh, we've been going around planting the indigenous trees. We even came to a rocha in Motamu and we enjoyed our stay there. We want to come again. <laughs> <laughs> so why, why we chose this verse? Because it's the first time that God talks to himself. It's the first conversation in the Bible. God is talking to himself. And he decides to make man. And then he says, let us make man in our image. Why? So that he may have dominion over the earth. So when a Christian comes and asks, um, what are the policy makers doing? Uh, it's kind of like self defeatist because God created you to be in charge of the earth, every human. So uh, it's in between us as humans to take care of the earth. So when we don't take care of the earth, it's like we are departing from what our design is. That's why you see, even if someone does not believe in God, they are hardwired to take care of the earth. We can't run away from that. So uh, just to summarize, what you have said in the last instance about us Christians not buying rice from Pakistan and it being stopped kind of like reflects how we would impact the environment. You see, uh, if voters decide to, do, to vote for someone, they don't believe in democracy, but <laughs> <laughs> So if majority of you <laughs> decide that you're going to use uh, the city property, you're going to like uh, put pedestrian lanes, or to use one of the things of that, you're going to put pedestrian lanes and bicycle lanes near the river, and you're going to put the markets there, and you're going to plant trees there. There's no one who can stop us from doing that, because we voters have decided, you see. So if we decide, that every year, as local tourists, we're going to go to Rocha, Kenya, and plant more roofs. After Rocha is done, we go to create a forest, we plant, we go to uh, between the city center and Westlands, and we say we're going to plant trees here, and people are going to walk here, we're going to go from the city center to Madaraka. No one can stop us. So it's not for the policy makers to make policy. <coughs> And then it trickles down, trickles down to us, and then we implement it. Sorry, it's for us to say we're going to do this. We unite as churches. We tell the people, hey, on Saturday we're doing this. Then they have to follow us. So in essence, what I'm saying is, we Christians have the power from heaven. We have the power on earth to change what we want to change. So let's not wait for it to come from above, the like policy makers, but we make our policy and. Well, I, just, I wanted to add something to, to hear his uh, position because I share his position. Uh, he's the first person I've met in Kenya that, that doesn't believe in democracy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that makes me feel warmer. <laughs>
<laughs> but um, I just thought that we stopped a little early because uh, if you read all the way to us to, to the end of that chapter, actually, the mandate continues and the uh, issue of subduing the earth and uh, replenishing it uh, is a very, very loud call. And so when he says we don't have to wait for a call from heaven, the call came already. <laughs> and uh, God said that we, when, when we deplete, we replenish. Um, but I was uh, very, very excited about uh, his, his take on you know, getting started ourselves and not having to wait for policy makers. But, you know, for most of us, doing something in the city might look already too big or we do not have the legislative mandate or whatever we need to get started. But I was thinking we have so much power in our individual homes and uh, we may have a bit of power in the, in the churches, um, you know, the church compounds that uh, we go to and institutions we go to. And so if you are at the university, I would expect that um, that is where you begin. Uh, flat trees, conserve what is there, etc. Uh, everyone who owns a home or is part of a home could uh, influence what goes on there. And I would especially uh, encourage that each church has at least some trees, every church compound. And if you look at your church compound and there are no trees, then we need to ask you. Um, you know, whether this message is just for a lot of you know. So I, I would not say it's, it's simple, as who would say it begins with you and me. But uh, it's more than rhetoric. We can actually do it. So if you come to my compound and ask me, do you have trees? I have too many. Actually, the problem is cutting down. Uh, I, I feel so much pain. <laughs> when I hear the power song. Thank you, sir. Okay, last question. Um, I take that as a, something good that has happened to me uh, for the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I decided to... The, um, the, the talk was really uh, eye-opening, um, especially how you bring in the biblical value uh, in terms of how it responds to the whole conversation of um, ecology. Um, I was, you also mentioned that maybe sometimes it seems as if the, the main problem, uh, which is that a this perspective in your, in your words, is that you know, there's this separation of the material from the spiritual. And I was wondering whether, at least if you look at some African cultures and how they understood such issues, they in tradition, some traditional societies or cultures see those things as maybe united somewhat. Mm. So for once, I know, I mean, for instance, in, you know, our grandparents, for, for instance, would sing songs as, as they would work in the gardens, um, spiritual songs, that is. And so there was a way in which those things were connected Some Are there any examples from traditional societies on good ecological practices? If you know any or have you researched any? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a very good point, actually. Um, and in a way, you're right, it goes back to that point I made that actually the, it kind of demonstrates how actually our response to the environment and the environmental problems is a spiritual problem. Um, because there's many examples around the world of where uh, habitats or sites are considered sacred in the traditional beliefs and traditional religion and are therefore protected. I mean, here in Kenya, we have the Kayas on the coast, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but on the Mijikenda tribe have these sacred sites which are within um, a forest often, and there's no cutting of trees and no removal of anything allowed from that sacred forest, uh, which can be very small, they can just be like one acre, or they can be quite a number of acres and be quite a bit bigger. Um, and as a result, those sites have become actually very important sites for biodiversity conservation. They're, they're known to be uh, holding uh, you know, species of plants and animals and birds and things which elsewhere have disappeared. You, if you go to Ethiopia, I remember I flew over Ethiopia once and you look down over Ethiopia and there's large areas of Ethiopia, as we heard earlier, have all the forest is gone and it's like desertified. 
and uh, but as you fly, you see a little circle of vegetation and habitat. And as you look, and you and as I found out, there's a sort of white building in the middle, and that's a church. We need our lifestyles. The the teaching of God, the gospel, needs to work beyond the church boundaries. Um, but in that, that is very much a, an example of the way that spiritual and traditional religions and beliefs have, around the world, been shown to have a very positive impact on the environment. Because there's often a, a respect for nature and so on. The Hindus believe, that, and the Buddhists believe, that you shouldn't kill anything at all. And so there's that sort of uh, protection of the environment uh, that happens. And sadly, when the church has come in and people have got saved, and we're seeing this on the coast with the Kayas, as people get saved, become Christians, they say, ah, it's mambo, you know, spiritual, <laughs> sacred forests and whatever, that's all mambo jambo, these are, you know, these are the evil spirits, and Jesus is Lord over all. And we don't need to do that. <laughs> so we don't need to worry about those things. And God has given us the forest to do what? To use. And those trees make good and bow and I can sell them and make some profit and, you know, buy, pay my children's school fee. So as a result, those sacred forests are actually disappearing, sadly. You know, even though they are protected in the law, despite that, they are going. Because people have lost that respect for the... And you think, ah, oh, guys, if only as the church, and it's a point that Felix made that, you know, actually the church has been left behind. And it's the secular non-believers who are leading the environmental debate and pushing the boundaries of conservation care. Instead of the church is the one behind causing the problem still. You know? We come in and say you don't need to worry about the evil spirits and all that stuff, because Jesus is Lord. Go and take what you want out of that forest. Rape it, guys. You know? And I used to, I was in a talk at the museum many years ago. About a guy doing studies in Nandi forest um, on a particular species of bird which was under threat and he was giving a presentation of his results and I remember he showed a slide he was talking about the threats to the forest and he showed a slide first of a, a school and it was a church school and he said this is the problem this church was given land by the president I don't know how many ten acres of land and they clear fell all of the forest, gone. And his next slide was of a logged tree, and he must have put up a, cru a cross, a crucifix, over the tree. And he said, the Christians are the problem. And I was sitting in the audience thinking, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? And that's true, sadly. Lynn White's uh, his essay back in the 60s, he was right in many ways. We have misinterpreted it. And just to finish with, I know we're going over time, just going to pick up on, on the verse that Steve read there about dominion. It's actually something I didn't talk about. Mm -hmm. Because many Christians, I've had a guy come to me after I spoke at a church here. He said, no, 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 no. But the Bible says, go and take dominion over and rule over the earth and subdue it. That means God has given me the right as a Christian to do what? To go and do what I want, to take what I want from the environment. And that's Trump's position. That's the American position. Yeah? That is our God-given right to take what we want from the environment. Yeah? And to do what we want with it. But my friends, I would challenge that interpretation of dominion. I would challenge that interpretation of rule. And when you read the Bible, I hope that all of you, when you read the Bible, you don't take things out of context. Understand that it is so important to read the Bible in the context of the overall text. That means the whole Bible, not just even the few verses where you're reading. And you've got to understand who is it written to, by whom, in what context was it written, and, and so on. When we're talking here about dominion, God is talking about dominion and rule. You've got to ask the question, okay, if God is talking about rule, then what is his definition? In the road in the thick jam, you get these guys blasting their horns, lights flashing. It's the governor passing. Leadership means get out of my way. I'm the boss. I have the right to drive where I want, when I want, do what I want. You get out of the way. You are the little small fry. I'm the big fish. And big fish and small fish. So you get out. Silly <laughs> quick, isn't it? And that is the dominant understanding of ruling. 
Guys, if you have a king, understand. He's going to take your children and set, put them to work. He's going to take taxes from him. From you, he's going to give you hardship. Just be away. No, no, we still want it. They got their kings and they suffered as a result. Yeah? And that is the world's understanding of ruling and dominion. Now, what is God's understanding? What is his definition of understanding? And for me, I like to look at Jesus. And particularly that passage of Jesus, as you're familiar probably with many of you, even if you're not a Christian, you may have heard of the one of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And in that, in that, that scene, in that setting, Jesus is in the room with his disciples. It's near coming towards when he was killed. And he stands up and he tells them, my friends, you know who I am. You know that I'm your Lord and Master. You know that I'm your King. Now this is what being a leader is all about. And he takes a towel and a bucket of water, and he goes and he washes the feet of his disciples. And he says, this is ruling. This is dominion. This is leadership. It's serving the ones who are below you. It is considering them better than yourself. It's putting them first before your own interests. And if God is telling us to rule over his creation, my friends, surely that is what he's asking us to do. And that is why creation is groaning and longing for the sons of God to be revealed. Because as we take on board that healing of God's relationship with the relationship with God, as we take that on board, as we ourselves are healed, as we have our mindsets changed, and that includes our understanding of leadership and of ruling, what an incredible difference that will do to the creation. The creation will rejoice because say, yes, finally, finally, we are being ruled over by someone who understands what ruling is, which is to take care of and to steward and to bring blessing and honor and glory to God through them. And so I, I just leave that with you as a last thought. Actually, you know, servant leadership is what we need. Not just, of course, for the environment, but for all walks of life. And uh, it's a problem we have across the world, across the world, servant leadership. You know, I long to see our leaders serving us in the way, and serving God's creation, serving the environment. But that's also for you in your own chamber, in your own garden, in your own house, the way you turn taps on and off, the way you turn lights on and off, the way you buy your food. It's all part of how we take dominion of the world. It's all part of serving the creation in our response to that. Thank you. Thank you. Hand up to me. Thank you, sir. And I can actually confirm you again that the way we've laughed in this session is <laughs> truly again. <laughs> Thank you so much. We would love to have you another time. Good. I'm very happy to hear about the environment. California planning. Asante. 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 A very nice speech. Come and see it. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. We come to the end of our session because time is always a challenge and we want to respect your time. So, to remind you so that I don't become part of these Kenyan leaders, or you know, Kenyans, we, we create an event and we say, Jimmy Gate is coming. And then people come and then we tell them, uh, we apologize. <laughs> Jimmy Gate will not be able to come, and they are, people have already paid for the event. So I said, we, we are sending out people to Gabes, Gabes people. Um, look at the title of my game, unless I say my own things. Christian apologetics through African eyes. And he is here. If you don't know Ruben to come, he is here. And he will be photographing those books as you buy them. He will be here in the front, here at the desk. Kindly buy your copy as stock client. Of a matter. And it's just 2,300. And I know he takes a dresser, even bitcoins. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. But don't mistake. And then for Mr. Steve, uh, our pastor here, Bishop of uh, Reverence, uh, I had him say it's a challenge. So, <laughs> just to clarify, this is not a challenge. Just apologetic is just a forum where we can discuss issues to prove our faith, challenge skeptics, but answer questions that cannot be answered in other forums. So, Karibu Tena Tena, you are invited. So, our next event, if you've not 
the bat it will be on 12 September next month. Come as we discuss an, an African faith. And we will be answering, is Christianity Africa? Come and let us think about these things. So God bless you, wish you all the best. We would like Pastor Kev to say the last word and to do a bit of a story. Yes. No, no, that's not. Just maybe a prayer. <laughs> <laughs>